Green Day was at a low point in the early 2000s. Their sixth studio album, Warning, despite mostly positive reviews, was a commercial flop, and the band was starting to be seen as old news. Not to mention, they were plagued with several unresolved interpersonal issues. After releasing a greatest hits and b-sides compilation, the band went into the studio to record what would be their seventh studio album, Cigarettes and Valentines. Unfortunately, the demos were stolen. With some guidance from longtime producer Rob Cavallo, Green Day opted not to re-record these demos and shifted directions, which would eventually culminate in the career comeback that was 2004's American Idiot. Suffice to say, this set the stage for where Green Day would be going next in their career. Flash forward to January 2006, and early prototypes of songs that would go on to become 21st Century Breakdown would begin to be written. Frontman for the band Billy Joe Armstrong was stating in a 2007 interview that they had something like 45 songs, with many being written on piano instead of guitar. Recording wouldn't begin until early 2008, or it would also be confirmed that Green Day would be working with producer Butch Vig, who you may know from producing Nirvana's sophomore album Nevermind. Over the course of two years of production, the band wrote about 45 songs, which was whittled down to the 18 that ended up on the album. In an interview, bassist Mike Durant said, I think at one point when we accumulated what we thought was probably enough songs, we rented out a small studio space down in Southern California, went into it just to kind of demo the songs a bit. Me and Trey always know about a third to a half of what Billy's singing, but we're so in the mode that we're not going, hey, what's this and this and this. He sat down and read out all the lyrics and we just started to see themes and correlations happening from song to song. And it just seemed to make sense. And 18, actually 17 of the songs ended up working out to be on the record. Towards the end of the recording process, Billy wrote a song called Murder City and we just had to put it on there too. Recording wrapped sometime at the start of 2009. Vig stated that frustrations amongst the band would lead to delays in recording. While Armstrong years later would say that following up American Idiot was stressful for everyone and that it was, quote, a hard album to make, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do because I set the bar so high and I did it to myself. Nobody was setting it for me. You sometimes feel like you're writing records and someone's got a gun to your head, but I actually was the one holding the gun. We were really trying to outdo ourselves. He would go on to state, it's one of my favorite records for Green Day for sure, but I have a hard time going back and listening to 21st Century Breakdown because it reminds me of all the hard work that went into it. In promotional interviews in early 2009, Green Day announced the album title of 21st Century Breakdown, and that would be another politically charged rock opera akin to American Idiot, this time broken up into three acts, Heroes and Cons, Charlatans and Saints, and Horseshoes and Hand Grenades, and it would follow a storyline told from the perspective of two characters, Christian and Gloria. However, the story is a lot more ambiguous than the previous album. As drummer for the band Trey Cool put it, we love big scary ideas. While Armstrong said, I like the three acts as I work in three parts. I have dual personalities, but I'm on medication, so that's okay. Heroes and Cons represents dealing with these two demons and what they mean. And then Charlatans and Saints deals with religion. The final act gets its name because horseshoes are a sign of luck and hand grenades are a sign of an explosion. The characters are just something I sing through. You give them a name and it gives them life. That April, the lead single for the album, Know Your Enemy, was released, being the first new Green Day song in nearly five years. The song received fairly decent reviews, with most publications saying that it was a pretty decent, if unremarkable, Green Day song. The cover for the album was designed by Chris Bellheimer and depicts graffiti artwork of a couple kissing, which are meant to represent the two protagonists of the album. The art was actually based on a piece from the artist Sixton, who actually didn't know who the couple were and only knew about them through mutual friends of theirs. However, many critics have noticed similarities between the cover of 21st Century Breakdown and the 2003 album Think Tank by Blur. I'll let you be the judge. Fortunately for the band, their labors would pay off, as on the 15th of May 2009, 21st Century Breakdown released to mostly positive reviews and debuted at number one in 24 countries, with the album selling 215,000 copies on day one and only four weeks later being certified gold by the RIAA, with it now being certified platinum. And this is all without the album being sold at Walmart. Its Metacritic score sits at an even 70, while its user score is at a 7.9 based on 387 ratings, while outlets such as the Rolling Stone and the Garvey gave it quite favorable scores. And there's Pitchfork, who hates everything that is ever made, unless it's these 12 albums. The release of the second single, 21 Guns, helped bolster the album, as the song would become their second biggest single on the Billboard Hot 100 after Wake Me Up When September Ends. It being featured on the soundtrack for Transformers 2 probably helped things and also gives me flashbacks to the movie whenever I listen to it. Both 21 Guns and the album as a whole were nominated for a handful of Grammys at the 2010 Awards, with the album winning Best Rock Album. The history lesson is largely over, now it's time to finally talk about the good stuff, because this isn't the History Channel, I'm not here saying that Green Day are secretly aliens. Anyway, I absolutely adore 21st Century Breakdown, it's my second favorite Green Day album, and one of my favorite albums, period. Despite this, I often find that the album is overlooked, or dare I say, underrated. This isn't a video about warning, so I can't call it that. F sure, it may have sold incredibly well with two really successful singles, but despite all of that, I don't really see people talking about it these days. But hey, I'm pretty confident in my ability to talk about this album, as I've kind of before, even if it was also about some directed DVD movie based around something I don't care about anymore. For this, however, I'm going to be going over the album track by track and analyzing the music like this is a middle school English assignment, and maybe discuss how I personally feel about certain songs along the way. Hopefully by the end, I can show you why I believe 21st Century Breakdown is an overlooked masterpiece. The name of the video. While it isn't a song, the intro prologue, Song of the Century, is still important to mention, as it sets the stage and lets the listener know basically what the whole album is going to be about in one minute of staticky lyrics. However, this may be a prologue, but it isn't the true opener. 
it's not even included as one of the acts if you look it up or at the back of the physical release because what comes next is what i'd argue is one of the best green day songs ever written I'd like to take a second to talk about the opening chords of the title track. Yeah, those. I'm starting off super subjective, but those two chords give me some of the most liminal nostalgia because I actually don't know why it makes me nostalgic, which means it's time for a tangent. If you only care about the analysis, just skip ahead to the timestamp on screen. Okay, so for a bit of context, I was two about to turn three years old when the album came out, which I'm 100% sure that I was busy listening to Anna music and whatnot, not Green Day. But I found many years later that my parents actually bought the album on iTunes, and coupled with the fact that this isn't nostalgia for when the album came out, and instead the vague time frame of the early 2010s, which is when I suspect they bought the album, it is within the realm of possibility that I, as a young kid in passing, heard those opening chords, and they kind of left an imprint on me, which was only reactivated when I heard the song for the first time as a teenager. I know this is totally superfluous to anything I'm going to be talking about in this video, but I felt compelled to mention it here because I just wanted to. Anyway, these two chords repeat themselves eight times, and during the second half, Trey begins building a beat which releases into an explosion as the song drops you right into the action. And the lyrical side of things during the first half touches on more personal topics, alongside allusions to the songs Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen, the last one born and, the first one to run. and Working Class Hero by John Lennon. I never made it as a working class hero. Or the opening line, Born into Nixon, I was raised in hell. References the birth year of the three members of the band, 1972. This part of the song not only helps ease you into the album, but also sets things up. Much like Song of the Century, the title track lays out what the album is going to be moving forward, but it's a lot clearer in how it does so, mainly being an actual song and not a minute long prologue. However, the song then switches tempo and theme in a way, which actually kind of caught me off guard when I first listened to it, changing from personal subjects to where the world was and to a degree is, in a style that Armstrong refers to as an Irish drinking part. In my opinion, while I like this part of the song, I prefer the opening, but this part is great too. The faster paced segment really hammers home a different side of the album that the more traditional sounding opening couldn't have done as well. The song finishes with another tempo change, ending with a grim commentary on the state of America. The music video for the song released on October 19th, 2009, both broadcasted live on MTV and online. The graffiti aesthetic of the video mirrors that of the album and features the band playing the song while Christian and Gloria are off doing stuff. A bunch of people are making out like they do in the front cover. An amazing video, even if it omits the opening chords, which, if you ask me, should be punishable by death. But I don't care. This video in particular is half the reason I love the graffiti art style. One of their best videos, in my opinion. In an interview with Fuse, Billy Joe said, That was a song that we noticed later kind of embodied a theme of everything else that was going on on the record. Songs like 21 Guns, Peacemaker, East Jesus of Nowhere all just kind of ended up like, Wow, this is, you know... It can be looked at like a nervous breakdown or a financial breakdown or like a breakdown of ideas. So it seemed like a broad statement. And I think that his statement really sums it up quite well. It gives you all you need to know for the ride ahead while standing on his own as a kick-ass song. The demo also slaps, by the way. Something else I want to draw attention to is the motif of the Class of 13 and how it doesn't really have a concrete meaning. In the traditional sense, there is a meaning, as Billy Zell's son graduated in 2013. But as for any other meaning, it's up to the listener. For me, I see it as representing the youth of society. Evidence to support this comes in the line, We are the desperate in the decline, raised by the bastards of 1969. Which could mean that the people who have been around longer than us and raised us have begun to let us down in regards to major world issues. Or it could be classism, socioeconomic class, who knows. As I stated prior, know your enemy, not that know your enemy. As I stated prior, know your enemy was the lead single for the album with it somewhat asking the listener a question in the chorus. Do you know the, enemy? the song itself is this kind of rallying cry, a feeling echoed by Armstrong, a song about rebelling against society and the system at large, which isn't exactly breaking new ground, yet doesn't feel played out. The lyric, a silence is an enemy, I get your urgency to rally up the demons of your soul, basically says that doing nothing is just as bad as perpetuating the system. In an interview with one live radio, when asked who the enemy we should know about is, Mike Durant responded, I think the enemy could be your own complacency, being satisfied with the way things are, yet still frustrated. Or it could be anything from prescription drugs to the people empowering your government. Moving to the video, it takes place in what I think is a prison or army base, which is weird because it takes place near a city. Anyway, Green Day are doing Green Day things as the footage cuts back and forth from standard filming to black and white CCTV footage. Anyway, near the halfway point, that's when the scary spotlights come in. It's almost as if Green Day themselves are the enemy in whatever situation this takes place in. Ends with a big fire. See you to your music video. 
Keep in mind, this is their big comeback song. In a vacuum, it's great, but compared to the other songs, it doesn't really stand out too much to me. It's not bad and can still go toe to toe with songs off Nimrod or American Idiot, but compared to the rest, it's pretty okay. Moving on to Video of La Gloria, which Mike Dirt stated was originally titled Emily, this is the first formal introduction of one of the protagonists by name. No duh. So I think it's finally time I address the album's narrative. The two characters are meant to represent two different sides of Billy Joe Armstrong, and two perspectives on the world. While Christian is a nihilist who wants to burn everything to the ground, Gloria keeps fighting to retain her optimistic ideals. She's also a combination of both Armstrong and his wife, Adrian. The storyline the album follows, as I stated in the history segment, is a lot looser and up to interpretation, in contrast to American Idiots, which was a lot more rigid in its content. The closest thing I could find to an official timeline of events comes from the fan site Green Day FM, which is basically one of the most comprehensive sites I could find. You can read their summary if you're curious, but even then, to one person it could be about a group of rebels overthrowing a system that's failed, to another it could be about a couple making their way through modern America. There isn't really a wrong interpretation. No matter how you look at it though, this is a song about someone who's held on to their hope and idealism, a song from the perspective of someone praising her and wanting that person to hold on to their beliefs. Focusing on the story for a brief moment, we can deduce that this song may be the first time they met, or at least early in their relationship. Another way to look at it, and one I thought of while writing this, is that the piano intro is the president, and the rest of the song is a flashback to when they first started out, or is Gloria's life story, and how she fights to hold on to her beliefs. Since the track finishes with the line, Tell me the story of your life. Which I'm a bit skeptical about since there's a song that I think fits better for the flashback description, but I really hope you're starting to see why the album's narrative is really vague. After three songs that really get the adrenaline pumping, a much needed slower paced song is what follows, which is exactly what Before the Lobotomy is, as well as being a great reflection on self-destruction. The opening acoustic guitar kind of reminds me of the song Minority from their album Warning. This is also the song where Christian is first mentioned by name, and the line, Christian sang the which not only introduces the second protagonist, but also subtly sets up the penultimate song of the album. Anyway, as mentioned like three sentences ago, this song primarily tackles themes of self-destruction specifically within the music world, which may explain an incident in 2012. Let me show you what what f***ing minute f***ing me. The song also expresses themes of longing for better circumstances, as well as days long past, with all these being expressed in the first segment of the song and repeated at the end. However, my favorite part of the song has to be the middle, as it just hits me the hardest. But what really sells this part of the song to me is the lyrical aspect. I've already talked about the first verse, but the rest do a great job of conveying strong emotions and painting some sort of picture. The line, to cast a stone and throw a brick, being a great way to represent political dissent. But my absolute favorite lyric is, Remember to learn to forget. Just the wordplay in that line is something else. It's so simple yet effective. It's also emphasized by the following line, Whiskey shots and cheap cigarettes. Which implies that the narrator, Christian, is repressing something through substance abuse, thus the theme of the entire song. Moving on from me nerding out over the lyrics, the song finishes with a reprise of the opening bit. However, instead of being on acoustic guitar, it brings in the whole band, allowing the song to come full circle in a way. All in all, it's a song that's a great break from the action, but doesn't feel like a lull in the track list. However, it can also be the calm before the storm for what comes after. Described by Billy Joe Armstrong as, quote, the most hateful song I've ever written, Christian's Inferno throws you right back into the action with the heart-pumping drum beat delivered by Trey, gives way for the rest of the instruments to come in. Something about the song, which becomes more prevalent in Act 2, is just how ominous the guitars sound. But for this song specifically, it really works. We've all been in places where we've been super pissed off, spouted shit we don't necessarily mean, but it's gotten to the point where it needs to come out of your system. Something of note is that a motif, especially for these next three songs, is that of fire or burning. This song is the most obvious example of it, but back in Before the Lobotomy, there was a line, You burned your dreams into the ground! Which could mean that in dire circumstances, Christian let his emotions get the better of him, which may be supported by the line in the first verse, There's fire in my veins and it's pouring out like a flood! This may hint that his fury has been pent up for quite some time. Suffice to say, Christian likely has anger issues fueled by addiction. The entire song does not relent in the sheer anger in the music. It keeps driving forwards at a fast, steady pace, with a chorus that is so straightforward but still has a sing-along quality to it that doesn't feel tiring with the amount of times it's repeated throughout the song. The line in the second verse, This diabolic state is gracing my existence. There's a great job at presenting that this isn't something that Christian enjoys feeling. In fact, he hates it just as much as anyone else. Later on, there's an allusion to the atom bomb, which I interpret as meaning that this could wipe it all clean, leaving nothing to be salvaged. The lyric, Chuck's in your reservoir and then return man to it. 
reinforces that this outburst probably wasn't done sober. It feels like I'm struggling to give the song any deeper meaning aside from I'm really fucking pissed off. It's because the lyrics take a bit of a backseat to the instrumental in this song, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because one, the instrumental kicks some serious ass, and two, it does a great job at portraying pure rage. On another personal note, I really fucking love this song. It actually embodied my grade 10 rage of 2022. Just something about how unapologetically angry it was stuck with me and was really cathartic, and to a degree still is. But this is, I'm going to talk about an album, not Dr. Phil, so I'm not going to get too personal. The song falls nicely into the next Last Night on Earth, which if before the lobotomy is the calm before the storm, and Christian's Inferno is the storm, then Last Night on Earth is the grim aftermath, which it, it to me feels as if Christian feels remorse for the outburst, and is compelled to affirm his love for Gloria, which is loosely described in the opening lyric, I text the postcard sent to you, did it go through? Sending all my love to you. A nod back to the previous song comes in the chorus. If I lose everything in the fire, sending all my love to you. Which to me means that Christian has realized the gravity of his outburst and knows he could lose it all. And this sappy letter is his way of affirming how much Gloria being in his life means to him. And at the end of the song, Christian questions if he came out of the rage whole with the line, Did I ever make it through? Now for me, this is probably my least favorite song on the album, but it's by no means bad. Just not one I come back to often, as for me, the song can get a little too cheesy for my taste. But I do get that after such a fast-paced song, uh, a bit of a relief is needed, and as the closer for the act, it does a solid job. The static -y intro of East Jesus Nowhere harkens back to Song of the Century, but it's in a twisted way. The title of the song, which was actually a quote taken from the 2007 film Juno and originally titled March of the Dogs, should clue you in that this song doesn't paint religion in the most positive of lights. Now, I'm going to try my best to keep my personal opinions and beliefs on religion out of this, as this is neither the time nor the place for that discussion, and instead I will aim to analyze the lyrics as they are. The song was written after Mike Dirt attended a service where a friend's child was baptized and was appalled by the hypocrisy displayed at the service. As any sane person could extrapolate, this ultimately culminated in a song rebuking religious fundamentalism. As for the meaning, the song discusses hypocrisy and the dark side of religion. When asked about the song, Billy Joe Armstrong said, The never-ending hypocrisy of religion, all those snake oil salesman types, and that subliminal thing of threatening people and ripping away their individuality. The line, Join the choir, we'll be singing, and the church of wishful thinking. Came to Armstrong after driving around to Wisconsin with some of his family, and saw a chapel labeled the Church of Divine Hope. He commented that it would be like calling it the Church of Wishful Thinking. The line in the chorus, I don't think has to do with Christian. Rather, is there to emphasize the following, which anyone at least a little bit familiar with history can tell you that there's been a lot of bad things done in the name of religion. Like, a lot. However, it could be Christian getting a little bit more furious seeing all the injustices caused by religion. Three chorus in the second verse indirectly calls out the points the band wanted to express, but the one before the last chorus I think is the most poignant, as it mentions how some people are ignorant to the ways they are manipulated, but also how religion has become a tool in politics, comparing politicians to missionaries. I mean, what's the point of separating church and state if laws are made on the basis of religion? And I think half the people watching this video have already left. This could also explain the line in the chorus. The sirens of decay will infiltrate the inside the inside in this case meaning the government usually this is sung as the sirens of decay will infiltrate the faith fanatics to me paints a less pessimistic outlook meaning that we the people will finally try and get through to those who peddle this prepackaged worldview onto others i know i'm kind of going all over the place but in the first verse the line put your faith in a miracle and it's non-denominational. Serves to mean no matter what religion, what denomination, there will always be people wanting to instill fear in the people with religion as their guise. This song was the third single released for the album. The third single was originally intended to be the title track, but the band opted for East Jesus Nowhere instead, pushing 21st Century Breakdown song release to December. And while there was technically a music video, it was just concert footage from the tour Green Day embarked on in 2009 to promote the album. The video isn't even up on the band's official YouTube channel, due to legal issues pertaining to one of the paintings projected on stage during the performance. If you dig around enough, you'll be able to find it. From a song calling out all the terrible shit religion has done, Peacemaker comes in and switches things up. Described by Mike Durnt as, quote, It's almost got a cool gypsy carnival feel. 
Now, this may come as a shock to some, but I'm not a big listener of Gypsy Carnival music, so experts in that genre, feel free to enlighten me. Joking aside, this was actually the first song that truly stumped me as to what it meant, which isn't the best of looks considering the ballsy title. But sometimes I need to ask for help, and as any schmuck would, I consulted the most wretched hive of scum and villainy aside from the flea market. Reddit. While I ham it up, I actually found the responses quite helpful, so thanks to the seven people, not even exaggerating, who responded. From what I was able to piece together, this is a song about vengeance. Vengeance to the point where it almost becomes sexual in nature, with the irony being that a peacemaker is a type of revolver, thus achieving peace through violence. Which makes sense, as the peacemakers actually might be the antagonists. Let me explain. I'd like to thank Reddit user Mystic Maniac 100 for giving me their interpretation of the lyrics, as it's what mine will be somewhat based off of even if I'll go into other perspectives. The Peacemakers are basically the group of people who Christian and Gloria are trying to fight against, the group going after people speaking out against this corrupt system. The organization might also have the backing of the church, which may explain East Jesus Nowhere, and the labeling of those as non-believers, and that they need to be removed, this being the entire first verse and chorus. However, as I said prior, this song is about revenge, and this is where I think that one of the characters, I'd wager Gloria, wants revenge on the Peacemakers. So keep in mind that Christian, by this point, is still probably an absolute wreck, and while he may have basically apologized for what he did, he still has to live with the aftermath, and could easily fall back to rage. And Gloria, in response, is starting to crack. You might be wondering why I said Gloria is the one who wants to get back at the Peacemakers and not Christian. This is because in the first verse, there's a line, well, dead to the girl at the end of the serenade. This can mean that Gloria has been on the radar, or they've already gone after her and failed. The second and third verses are her and the Peacemakers basically in a standoff, with the first half being from Gloria's perspective, and verse 2 likely being Christian, and the second being from the Peacemakers. The fourth verse might even be sung entirely from her perspective, showing how she's starting to slip. The line, Well, now they can't take us, the Undertaker, so I'm gonna go out and get a Peacemaker. This is a Neo Saint Valentine's Massacre. Kind of describes this perfectly. So, this song may have a kill count, but it also reveals that 21st Century Breakdown takes place in Detroit, and I think I may have finally lost it because of a song that came out when I was three years old, but here we are. Crazy tangent aside, this brings us to Last of the American Girls, the fifth and final single of the album, released on March 22nd, 2010. Part of what inspired the song was the work Billy Joe did constructing homes for those who lost theirs in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, which is almost directly referenced in one of the pre-choruses. But another major influence on this song is Armstrong's wife Adrian. Can I just mention that the bass line in the opening that Mike delivers is so f groovy. Even the instrumental in the chorus is great. This song's lyrical component is clearly about Gloria and how she's unwavering in her beliefs, explaining to us that she's been like this for a while. Maybe this even being her backstory, and I think this song fits the description better than Viva La Gloria does. The line, She makes enough to survive for her holiday working class. Paints the picture that she used to, or still does, have to remain a cog in the machine she fights against which isn't all too dissimilar to how Christian started at the beginning, the duo never making it as working class heroes, possibly leading them to rebel in the first place. However, the line, She's a runaway of the establishment incorporated, may imply that she used to have a better job, but was either laid off or quit because it didn't suit her ideology, which may even reference the 2008 financial crisis. As the song goes on, it's revealed that she also supports those who are like her, but the line, She's a hero for the lost cause, means that damn damn yankees not that lost cause <laughs> means that deep down she knows that change may never be achievable yet she keeps fighting because it's what she believes in the music video was released on april 1st 2010 this was no april fool's joke however as the music video depicts gloria partaking in everyday activities out in the desert with the video cutting back to greendale every so often and hold on is she watching the videos for 21st century breakdown and 21 guns on the tv so this video is either not relevant to the story or that both Green Day and those songs exist in-universe, which makes even less sense since the person who played Gloria in this video also did so in 21 Guns. Either way, it's a neat easter egg and ends with a car exploding like any video should. B tier. The song eventually devolves into this beeping at the end, which flows into the next song, Murder City, which is also what I call my hometown. This was the last song written for the album, and the first after the election of Obama. The inspiration for the song came after the band went out for drinks after a mass demonstration where a kid got shot by cops while handcuffed. Despite not being present for the riot, they did witness the aftermath, thus leading to the line I'm wide awake after the riots And a reference to drinking comes in the form of Like a bottle of your favorite poison Which is used as a simile to compare it to hollow laughter And did I seriously remember what the f*** a simile is? God damn it The song is actually quite similar to Christian's Inferno in structure In that there's not much to it The chorus mostly carries the song With the verses only adding a little bit of context since I already kind of talked about the first verse, I'll just move on to the second, as the riot described in story was done as a part of their growing movement. Well, Christian's crying in the bathroom, 
And I just want to buy my cigarettes. Showing that both of them are starting to believe that all this could be for nothing. Especially seeing as the right in question is now over. But the line... We've come so far, we've been so wasted. Reinforces the dedication to trying while potentially being a meta commentary on Green Day themselves. Viva La Gloria, Little Girl, is a dark reprise of the earlier song, Viva La Gloria. Also, I will be referring to the song as Little Girl from here on out. Anyway, where Viva La Gloria was Christian praising Gloria, this song is him accusing her of being a, quote, dirty liar. As for he believes, it was her that caused the riot to fail, which is a shift in character for him. As prior, he's only gotten frustrated at the broader systems at play, never at Gloria directly. This is best expressed in the openings of both songs, as while they both use the piano to lead into the rest of the instruments, they use them in different ways. Where Viva La Gloria's is more whimsical, Little Girl's is more unsettling. In an interview with Q Magazine, Billy Joe Armstrong stated that, quote, It's about a woman with a heavy drug problem. Viva La Gloria is about a person who has a vision, but this is a person who's distorting that vision with drugs and self-destruction. Which could mean that this is Gloria going through withdrawals, just spiraling more and more into a similar, albeit less angry, direction to Christian, wrought on by feelings of self-doubt and hatred. With the chorus emphasizing the despair that Gloria is overcome by. With Christian seeing her as, You're a the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army being an allusion to the Peacemakers. As in his mind, this was her idea. Also, can I just say I adore the line, There is no place like home when you got no place to go. Gives me chills every time. As it goes on, it delves more into Christian taking out his frustration on Gloria, as he is beginning to slowly lose faith in their movement, even accusing her of treason. In the line, Your bloodshot eyes will show your heart of treason. And being, you're just a junkie preaching to the choir. In the bridge, the lyrics show us that no matter where she runs, this will always follow her regardless. Little Girl ends with an unfinished chorus that's cut off by a... Well, let me just show you. It almost sounds like a piano string breaking. The ending of Little Girl actually kind of hard cuts into the next song, Restless Heart Syndrome. Which reminds me a lot of Boulevard of Broken Dreams off of American Idiot. Remember what I was saying in Christian's Inferno about how ominous the guitars are? Well, the same applies not only to this song, but Little Girl as well. Whereas Little Girl had this swing tempo to it, Restless Heart Syndrome feels like a song that you'd listen to while roaming the streets. However, they both feel like they're cut from the same cloth, which leads me to believe that they might actually be the same song from two different perspectives, as both are about someone struggling with addiction and living with its consequences. Billy Joe noted that it's about pharmaceuticals. A lot of people become junkies if they get the right prescription. Again, I'm not going to say y'all should have seen the one minute incident coming, but... One minute! Putting that aside, Mike Dirt echoed this sentiment, with him stating, That song is about government-regulated emotions. You know, in America, we can't get healthcare, but under government-regulated drugs, we have more commercials on TV for new drugs all the time than just about anything else. You know, on one hand, you're constantly being told you gotta be on pills, you gotta fix your emotional state of mind, and yet on another hand, you might be trying to kill off old nightmares, but you could end up killing your dreams instead. Part of why I think Restless Heart Syndrome and Little Girl are the same song, but from two perspectives, or at least one's a response to the other, is this could be Gloria delving deeper into substance abuse, with a song tying back to the previous in that she wants to run away, but this is in the metaphorical sense as she's only running to the pharmacy to lose her memory. Although it's unclear if she and Christian are separated, however, I doubt they're around each other at this time. This is no big breakup or whatnot. In all likelihood, this is probably just they've stormed off. And the line, I need to find a place to hide. You never know what could be waiting outside. Might even be Gloria going back to Christian, for she fears she may be caught by the peacemakers, and he's the only person she can think of. Something else I want to point out is the way the line, Know Your Enemy, is brought into the song, with it coming right after, You are your own worst enemy. Which may be Gloria thinking back to what she did as she's going through a depression bout. The song then goes into the guitar breakdown, which I absolutely love. It's just so intense and fits the tone of the song so well, feeling natural as well as coming so suddenly all at once. However, there's something about it that I want to get to, but I will a little later. I'm going to come right out and say it. I think that this act is the best stretch of songs on the album. It moves at a million miles a minute, but every song stands on its own and is one absolute win after another. And what better way to kick off a killer act than with a song that shares its title? Or Shoes and Hand Grenades was originally written for the lost album Cigarettes and Valentines, making it possibly the oldest song on the album. However, the lyrics were reworked to fit the style and themes of 21st Century Breakdown. The title is adapted from a quote by Frank Robinson about how being close only matters in horseshoes and hand grenades. Producer Butch Vig was actually the one who put his foot down and told Green Day they had to put this on the record because he liked it that much. And Billy Joe said in reference to the song, It's kind of about declaring your independence, but getting completely f***ed up at the same time. But once again, much like Peacemaker and nearly every other song on the album, it's really up to interpretation. 
Greenday.fm states that this song is about the aftermath of a breakup brought on by cheating, a song from the perspective of someone who's rightfully pissed off about it. But I think it's about coming up short in life and dealing with it, all while being frustrated. Almost like a midlife crisis song in a way. This is also supported with what I said earlier about the title and chorus. However, I think that in the first verse, it's about getting pissed about the what could have been. But as the song goes on, especially in the bridge, it's like you're regaining a little bit of the motivation to try again. But in the back of your mind, you know you might as well fail. Oh, and the scream in the bridge is easily the best part of the song in my opinion. I also for the longest time misheard the G-L-O-R-I-A at the end as do you know how hard I hit? It was actually until researching for this video that I found out I was mistaken. To frame it in the context of the story, I interpret the song as being sung from Christian's perspective, and about how after he told Gloria off, he's pissed about how they came close to change, but it ended up going nowhere. At this point, he's started to come to his senses, saying to Gloria that he wants her to kick the ever-living out of him as he thinks he deserves it. However, the second verse shows that he's still holding onto that grudge, at least a little bit, but in the bridge realizes that they have the opportunity to try again, the last line being repeated as a way to say that he's not directing his hatred at himself or Gloria anymore, but back at the oppressors. Or at least, that's what I think. I could be missing something. I don't know. At the very end, there's these bits of static that flow into the next song, The Static Age. According to Genius, Billy Joe Armstrong said that this is about taking every sort of advertisement and things that you don't need and just sort of defacing them. Because a billboard that is trying to sell you something is sort of static. Oh, like static is in movement. I just, I just got this now. You're witnessing this in real time. The Static Age, as I interpret it, is about ridding yourself of all the corporate jargon and all that bullshit. And realizing that big companies and other such institutions don't control you. The first verse I also find notable as it directly mentions religion, which might be a jab at televangelists. Something else about the song that I adore is the bridge, specifically that guitar solo right at the end of the third verse. Something about it just hits me in just the right spot every time I listen to it, it just scratches that itch I always need. It honestly is a highlight of the album for me. For how it fits in the narrative, I think this might be the second attempt at a riot, this time targeting what is used by the government and peacemakers to suppress the populace, the mass media, i.e. radios. They know that the flame of their movement hasn't been snuffed out just yet, and some still believe in the cause. So in targeting this propaganda, they can kind of pick up where it was left off. The song, from a story perspective, is about this revolt working. It works a little too well to the point where it seems the rebellion gains the upper hand over the peacemakers, leading the two protagonists to have to take shelter for a brief period. With the third verse basically being this declaration of independence in a way, and yes, I know what Billy said about horseshoes and hand grenades, but I think it also works here too. The Static Age fades nicely into the next song, 21 Guns, which is no doubt the biggest song off the album. Released as the second single on May 25th, 2009, the song would go on to be a smash hit amongst critics and fans, and being nominated for two Grammy Awards and also becoming their last song to chart in the top 40 within the US. And as mentioned in the beginning, the song was also heavily featured in the movie Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. The song tackles several topics, such as patriotism, love, war, peace, prejudice, and others, but the title of the song being a direct reference to the 21 Gun Salute, which is done in honor of a fallen soldier. It was also one of the songs originally written on piano during production. As Armstrong put it, I think a lot of people think that this song is about world peace or something, but I also think there's like maybe sort of surrendering to the static to try and find some kind of inner peace or, you know, finding strength in silence. You know, surrendering doesn't always have to mean that you're giving up, but maybe it means that you're just trying to find a little humanity. Something that I really personally enjoy about the song, and this time it's not me gushing about the guitar solo in the bridge, even if I'll talk about that later, is that love and war are used almost as allegories for one another. And I think a great example of this is in the chorus, where you could interpret the word arms as being about the limb or weaponry, which goes to show that a tumultuous relationship and a pointless war have more in common than we think, and fighting over nonsense gets us nowhere, even if doing so boosts your personal pride. The last line of the chorus, you and I, is also there to show that ceasing fighting must be mutual. The entire first verse is basically asking the listener questions, either about their allegiances, or Did someone break your heart inside? These questions are obviously rhetorical, but they serve to lay down the song's core themes. The second verse starts with being at your wit's end and letting the dark parts of your mind take a toll on you, leading to some sort of loss of control. As it goes on, it describes someone being punished for their faith, with all this maybe being brought on by alcohol abuse. However, what I find notable is the coupling of the line Nothing's ever built to last. and the pre-chorus which could allude to literal ruins, while well, maybe serving as a light allusion to 9-11, but it also could be taken in a metaphorical sense, that how maybe it's time to move on from your current state even if you're in a bad spot. Now I can finally discuss what I always mention being the highlight of the song, the bridge. But that's for good reason, because if there's one thing I think Green Day does not get enough credit for, it's that they know how to make a killer bridge. And 21 Guns is no exception. I'll get to the lyrical aspect in a minute, but what I want to hone in on is the guitar solo, and just how similar it is to that of Restless Heart Syndrome.
The drum beat before the intro reprise reminds me of the gimme gimme revolution part of Know Your Enemy. This to me represents a turning point. If Restless Heart Syndrome was the emotional low point of the album, then 21 Guns is where things start to improve. As for the lyrics, the imagery of fire not only alludes to Christian, but the way it's worded it could also mean that you may have started out with good intentions, but it wound up having disastrous consequences and biting you in the ass by the end. But what's most notable for me is the line, Like a liar looking for forgiveness from the stone in which the stone could easily be interpreted as the grave, thus looking for forgiveness in death, because it's too late. While the post-bridge verse, as I like to call it, basically boils down to whatever caused your pain is in the past, and we need to move on from it. In my personal opinion, 21 Guns is an amazing anti-war song that still holds as much weight now as it did back in 2009. As for how the song ties into the narrative of the album, it can be taken in two different ways. Either this is Christian and Gloria's relationship falling apart even more, or it's where things finally start to improve. However, I lean towards the latter because of the guitar solo in the bridge. Since I see that song as a low point for them, this song may be where things start to get better. In essence, it's where their character arcs conclude. Christian has recovered from his inferno, and Gloria has stopped spiraling downward. As I'm pretty sure that this song is sung from her perspective, or it's the two talking to each other. The second verse might even be from Christian's perspective. And the post-bridge verse is them realizing that they need each other. Then again, I might be painting the exact opposite picture, just like the rest of the album, it's up to interpretation. The music video was directed by Mark Webb, who also did other videos for 21st Century Breakdown, as well as videos for Weezer, The All-American Rejects, Maroon 5, My Chemical Romance, and others, and both of the Amazing Spider-Man movies. The video was released first on MySpace, yes it's that old, on June 22nd, 2009, and uploaded to Green Day's official YouTube channel on October 7th, 2009, being their second most viewed video behind Boulevard of Broken Dreams by a wide margin. It's also notable for being the third video to feature the band's touring guitarist, Jason White. He would later appear in the video for Last of the American Girls before briefly joining as a member during the duration of the trilogy. The video depicts Christian and Gloria seeking refuge after committing some illegal activity. Anyway, cops show up and open fire on the two as footage of the band is spliced in between. They also must have really good luck as they're not even visibly injured by the end, because there is no way in hell that not a single stray bullet hit them. The recreate the album cover, video's over. No animals were harmed production. Pretty good, A tier. The song ends with more static, which is something of a motif throughout this act. However, this static is what leads us into American Eulogy, which starts with the shortened reprise of Song of the Century. Arguably the most overtly political song in the album, it, like a few other Green Day songs, has multiple parts to it, being comprised of two, Mass Hysteria and Modern World. Mass Hysteria being the first piece written specifically for the album. I think it's relatively uncontroversial to say that this is the climax of the album. The opening Song of the Century reprise is see as showing how far everything has come since the beginning of the album, before snapping into Mass Hysteria, which does an excellent job of calling out media paranoia and a deadbeat government. The line, Red alert is the color of panic, elevated to the point of static. Those that being under perpetual alert will make it all just feel like white noise, and the populace will grow apathetic. Something that I personally enjoy about the song is all the small ways that it ties back to previous songs in the album. Ones I find notable are the use of the word fanatics in the first verse of Mass Hysteria, tying back to East Jesus Nowhere, acoustic guitar in Mass Hysteria's bridge being similar to that in the one before the lobotomy, and allusions to the class of 13 are made throughout. Mass Hysteria itself paints a picture of sheer chaos, as if the entire world has been thrown into turmoil. In essence, this song is the 21st century breakdown. Everything is in a decline and spiraling out of control. The line, Mass confusion is all the new region that's creating a feeding ground for the bottom feeders of hysteria. Means the mass hysteria has almost become like a fad, leading the media, the bottom feeders, to capitalize on it. The song goes on to keep calling out media and government, saying that and the deaf mutes mislead in the choir as a metaphor for poorly running a country. Even going on to allude to the botched response to Hurricane Katrina because the martyr is a compulsive liar when he said it's just a bunch of oh. Oh, uh, he, he said the, oh, yeah, he, that's the, he said the, he said the n-word. Uh, I find that there's a double meaning to the phrase class war, which could mean a war between the upper and lower classes or the class of 13. And at the end, there's a call for Christian Gloria to lead, but it seems they're nowhere to be found. The song then shifts into modern world with one of the best guitar riffs on the album. It feels like classic Green Day, but fits the rest of the album so well. I also love it because I find it really nostalgic, but who cares? The chant of a chorus I see as a declaration of not caring. Kind of like burnout. It's like, you know what? Fuck this. Fuck the world. I don't want to live in it anymore. I don't care about it. But my absolute favorite part of the song is the vocals delivered by Mike Dern. It gives the song that extra punch that makes it just that much better. The first verse of Modern World I see as being from the perspective of the class of 13, the youth of society, or other rebels, and how they see things in the era of descent. The second verse is in direct reference to the class divide. 
constant struggle between rich and poor, with gentrification directly mentioned. The song ends with the two songs blending together into one, before fading out into static, a sensory overload, while in the background there's subtle beeping akin to Last of the American Girls. Just like that, it's over. But not yet. See the Light is, in my opinion, the perfect way to finish the album. While not the best song at the closing spot, it's easily the best from the perspective of feeling like you've finished the journey. It's about reflection while trying to find some deeper meaning in yourself and a path to go down in life. As Billy Joe Armstrong put it, I think a lot of that is just trying to find like a deeper truth. When you go song to song to song to song, like we've just been talking about, I think Sea Light kind of sums up the journey. It talks about the streets, and it talks about deserts, and it talks about the rivers, and it talks about natural disasters in every crisis, from the swine flu to Hurricane Katrina and everything in between, which is a lot. So I think it's just trying to find some more meaning in life and more belief in yourself. The opening two chords of the song are the same as those played at the start of the title track, however at a slightly faster speed. This does a great job of making the album come full circle and give the feeling of closure. The opening line, Well I crossed the river, fell into the sea, represents that while one challenge has been overcome, a new one has taken its place. However, this song is not about doom and gloom, it's about having this feeling of hope in a time of hopelessness. The lyric, Where the non-believers go beyond belief, I see as referencing people who aren't spiritual but continue to find meaning. While the line, Then I scratch the surface, in the mouth of hell. I view as saying that the change one person initiates can only go so far, and that it will take time to see major progress be made. The chorus of the song I take as being a sort of plea, that you've gone through the hardest of times and are looking for some purpose and solace, hope that things will improve, not to feel lost in a transitional period. While the first verse mainly focuses on a feeling of hope, the second verse is more about looking back on what got you here. The first line directly mentions addiction, which could be that this is about getting clean as it's sung in the past tense. And I think it's safe to say that the individuals who've sobered up are Christian Gloria, which would also explain the next line about being chased, as they can now finally rest easy with the lines, Then I drank the water from a hurricane And I set a fire just to see the flame this could reference the revolution which are compared to hurricanes, as well as once again referencing Katrina. However, what I think is the most important line in the whole song and arguably the whole album, is the last line of the third verse. Where the ever after is in the hands of fate. Where the ever after is in the hands of fate. As in my opinion, it perfectly sums everything up. This isn't a happy ending in the traditional sense, more of a clean slate ending with a hopeful undertone. Hope can only get us so far. For real change to happen, it takes time and a lot of effort. It's in the hands of the people to decide whether or not things improve. And to me, that's a really powerful statement, and why I think this album is truly something special. Something else of note is that this is the only song in the act not to contain any static, which I find quite notable thematically, almost as if you want to be rid of all the confusion and contradictory messages and seek clarity to see the light. And at the end of it all, there really isn't much of an answer or solution, just a clean slate to fill. I hate to compare the two, but it's kind of like how American Idiot ends. You finish the journey, but still don't have all the answers. I could go on a whole tangent about all the personal attachment I have to the song, but we'd be here all day. The TLDR is what I said about those two chords in the beginning of the title track, just cranked up to 11 as the entire song is built around them. For the past little while, I've done this thing where I start and end summer with the same song, and for summer 2022, I chose See the Light as that song, which to me kind of emphasizes is why I see the chorus as being this plea, but that's neither here nor there. Phew! I'm finally done analyzing the lyrics of the album, and I can finally move on to my main point. What the f is that? No. No, no, you, you've got to be f kidding me. Uh, the B-Sides. I'm only covering these because I know people will yell at me for forgetting them. I didn't, but it still doesn't change the fact that I don't care about them because most of them are covers. The only two original songs that were b-sides were Lights Out and Hearts Collide included on the single for Know Your Enemy. However, both are suspected of originating from the cigarettes and Valentine's sessions due to dates not lining up. While both are pretty good, they're relatively inconsequential and not required listening. I see Lights Out as being the album's bad ending. It paints this really dismal picture of things, almost the polar opposite of See the Light, but I'm glad it wasn't the end of the album because doubling down on pessimism would have been redundant. Out of the two original b-sides, it's my favorite. Hearts Clyde, on the other hand, is okay. If I docked Last Night on Earth for being cheesy, this one's even more so. Not bad, but nothing amazing. I feel like it would have been a Viva La Gloria type song if included on the album. Overall, you're not missing much, but if you're curious, I'd give him a listen. Okay, now I'm done with the songs. 
For the record, if you personally dislike the album, that's fine by me. And don't get me wrong, it's a flawed album. But overall, opinions on the album basically fall into one of two camps. Either the album is just okay, or it's one of their best. Or some third one. While I'm certainly guilty of perpetuating this to an extent, you still rarely see in-depth discussion about it these days, and the only songs I see talked about are the two big singles. It's one of their best-selling records and third most streamed on Spotify, even though it's in a distant third place. So why has it been almost completely forgotten? I think the biggest reason why the album is overlooked is that it had to live up to American Idiot. Suffice to say, American Idiot was a tough act to follow, so whatever Green Day put out after was going to be compared to it no matter what, destined to live in its shadow unless they wanted to call it like American Idiot 2. The band even said they felt like they had to outdo themselves. And it's also important to consider what came after. Putting aside any of my personal opinions, their trilogy of Uno, Dos, and Trey in 2012 is undoubtedly one of their most ambitious projects to date. So the album being sandwiched between their big comeback and arguably their most ambitious project, it seems like it was almost bound to get lost in the shuffle. Something else that may be holding it back is the album's nearly 70 minute runtime. Green Day albums tend to be on the shorter side, about 35 minutes to about an hour. While this length isn't exactly unusual for an album, it's still more than people were probably used to, and it's also their longest album to this day. However, the runtime isn't padded with fluff tracks that serve no point to the narrative or are hollow in their message. I hope I'm not alone in saying that most of the songs on this record are amazing, that hit just as hard when listened to on their own, as well as when listened to in the track listing. Something else to keep in mind was something out of Green Day's control, the time it was released and how it may have felt redundant. They already criticized the government in the War on Terror, and coupled with the album's release after the election of Obama, it could have been seen as doubling down on the concept done before, and now was less relevant. However, Bush was still fresh in the minds of the American people. The troops were still in Iraq, the scars of Katrina were recent, the economy was in the aftermath of a recession, and Bin Laden was still out there. Regardless, in my opinion, the album has stood the test of time and feels distinct when compared to Green Day's other albums, with some of their best songs that still continue to be relevant all these years later, while not coming off as preachy. It's truly a shame, as 21st Century Breakdown does its own thing while not feeling like a soulless cash grab. While it's certainly a flawed album, it's not held back because of it, and I'm able to look past the flaws. To me, it not only lives up to American Idiot, but is a great time capsule, and an album that is still too pertinent nearly 15 years after its release. That's why I think 21st Century Breakdown is a truly remarkable album, and an overlooked masterpiece. Alright, so that was, I know that was a lot to kind of take in all at once. Uh, this is my first one of these style of videos. It might be the only one of these I make. Uh, I don't know. Hope not, honestly. I've wanted to talk about 21st Century Breakdown for a little while now. As long-winded as this video did get. I hope you enjoyed as well. I mean, I, I did technically make that um, video earlier, but I mean, I didn't really uh, talk about 21st Century Breakdown in the traditional sense that way. Uh, but now I finally was able to, because I mean, it's one of my favorite albums of all time, and um, I'm fine. I'm glad I was I was able to. So yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed this, whatever the hell this is, and yeah, and, uh, until next time, uh, see you around.